After revisiting my sources on Basel III and cross-checking everything against the documents from the BIS, I wanted to provide an update with Basel III, what it really means for gold, because there is a lot of confusion out there. So let's dive on in. Now, this channel provides global macro insights and champions the importance of sound money in a world gone crazy, so please do consider subscribing. So let's back up and consider the key aims of the Bank of International Settlements, the shady BIS. And their key aim is, of course, uh, the control and complete monopoly power of currency globally via the system of central banking and commercial banking. To that end, they will seek to ensure that their institutions remain in charge and of course gold and silver are enemies of the fiat currency system. Now previous Basel Accords have had a dramatic impact upon economies globally. For instance, each previous round of the Basel Accord has deemed mortgage debt to be increasingly less risky. Where in Basel 1 in 1992, 50% risk weightings were applied to mortgages. Basel 2 agreed in 2004 saw the risk weighting of mortgages being reduced to 35%. They then allowed banks to calculate their own internal risks. House prices really took off throughout the Western world as credit flowed to real estate markets before that sudden contraction in credit took place. Now, of course, the consequence was the great financial crisis of 2008, and this provides us with a useful case study in understanding the Basel Accords and its desires under the net stable funding ratio, which is due to be introduced in Europe at the end of June this year. Back in September 2007, a British bank, Northern Rock, suddenly faced an enormous funding crisis. The bank had been providing mortgages for 25 to 30 year periods. Now initially these mortgages were financed via demand deposits, that is customer saving deposits. This was the capital or liability for the bank financing the bank's asset, the mortgage it offered. And this is, of course, the conventional understanding of the banking system, that the bank takes a customer deposit on one hand, a liability to the bank, which will need to be repaid upon demand and relends that in the form of a loan, an asset to the banking system. But Northern Rock, in their desire to expand their business, uh, began lending from the interbank lending market to enable them to offer more mortgages and to increase the loan to value to levels such as 125%. However, this situation posed a complete mismatch in the bank's capital and its assets. Short-term borrowing and longer-term lending for 30-year mortgages, a clear recipe for disaster. In the good times, there was no problem, but as soon as banks' trust in one another deteriorated, it meant that Northern Rock could not meet its short-term funding obligations in the interbank lending market. As news of their illiquidity spread, customers then sought to withdraw their currency from the bank. Now the lessons here are clear for the bankers that stable funding must be used to finance certain assets. The riskier the assets, the more stable funding required. This is particularly the case when it comes to mortgage products which may need to be fire sold at a loss or could even go no bid in the event of an all out crisis. We saw just that with the demise of Lehman Brothers uh, under the weight of their collateralized debt obligations or CDOs in 2008. By requiring stable funding capital, the BIS is betting that it should help to avert the risks posed by a mismatch in assets and capital on the bank's balance sheet. So if we consider the most stable, highest quality forms of capital, this includes the bank itself selling equity or a stock to raise capital. It also includes core capital and disclosed reserves on their balance sheet. Ultimately, long-term capital is perceived as less risky and more costly for that matter than low-cost short-term capital. Take demand deposits or interbank lending. They're both cheap sources of capital but can be withdrawn at any time.
This makes financing through these shorter term methods risky, just as we discussed with Northern Rock. And when markets are under stress, those markets often tighten. And so by setting a net stable funding ratio, it requires banks to finance long-term assets with long-term money. This is meant to encourage banks to carefully uh, manage their risks, but of course different assets are given different risk weightings according to the percentage of stable funding needed to finance them. And on the spectrum of asset risk, those, deemed, uh, those assets deemed most risky and therefore requiring the highest unstable funding ratio are 100% for equities and non-performing loans. 50% for high quality liquid assets, while bank reserves held at the central bank together with banknotes and coins have a zero required stable funding ratio. And so what weighting should gold be given due to its available liquidity and its lack of counterparty risk? Well, it has some price volatility, of course. So 15, 20, 30%. No, the BIS, never keen to promote the role of gold, has given it an 85% stable funding ratio, meaning financing gold as a bank asset must be done with 85% uh, longer term, more expensive funding. To be clear, this is an increase in the risk weighting of gold, the original risk-free asset. But the BIS have also gone on to state that at national discretion, gold bullion held in own vaults or on an allocated basis to the extent it is backed by bullion liabilities can be treated as cash and therefore risk weighted at 0%. Now, on the face of it, this seems promising for allocated gold, risk weighted at 0%. However, it's weighted at cash because it is backed by bullion liabilities, i.e. a short position against the future price of the metal. So on one hand, the bank is long, and on the other hand, the bank is short, leaving a net neutral position at zero risk, and it is allocated gold, of course. Now, this would only offer the bank a return if they were to lease out the uh, allocated metal. However, the LBMA have been fighting these changes tooth and nail. This is because most bullion in London is traded and settled on an unallocated account basis, where the uh, customer does not own specific allocated bars and simply has a paper entitlement to metal. This is where clearly the LBMA are upset, as the cost to banks in ensuring a required stable funding of 85% for unallocated bullion would significantly increase the cost of doing business. With Scotiabank leaving uh, the sector last year, there is the possibility that other banks may follow. Does it reduce the LBMA's global authority? Judging by their fight, unquestionably so. And to that end, we must ask who is really driving such changes, for we know that a dramatic global shift is underway from west to east, and China has, of course, uh, been stockpiling gold. So what does this all mean for the gold price? Well, on the face of it, if there is less trading of unallocated gold and less rehypothecation, this may seem longer term price supportive, but it is tough to say, as any bank who wants to go long on gold, either allocated or unallocated, must finance this with 85% required stable funding, making it far less attractive to do so. Moreover, it remains to be seen how well enforced such rules will be, given banks in recent times are hardly well regarded for their prudence. But all in all, gold is treated negatively under the Basel III agreement, and this makes perfect sense when we consider that it is being driven by the BIS. Clearly, the banking sector does not wish to elevate the position of gold to rival their fiat currencies, even their CBDCs, unless they truly have no choice. And anyway, there are so many other macroeconomic reasons to be long-term bullish on gold in terms of our own wealth preservation that I don't think we should worry too much about this. 
Now I've written up this video and put it on my Substack page, so you may well want to check that out if you just want to go through the finer points that we've discussed here. So thanks so much for watching. Do consider subscribing, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye.